week eight of the uh, fundamentals webinar. Today, today's lecture will be talking about cryptocurrency for the masses, mainly scaling Bitcoin or scaling blockchains in general. Today we'll be talking about, uh, we'll first start off with a background of scalability, you know, why we care about scalability and what the scalability problem actually is. And then throughout this lecture, we'll be going over different scalability solutions, evaluating their pros and their cons and what they actually bring to the table. So it'll be kind of like a case study of different solutions that have um, been implemented and are in the process of being implemented. So those solutions will be Taproot, then sharding, segregated witness, the Lightning Network, Plasma, and finally, Optimistic Rollups. Uh, I'm one of your lecturers for today. Uh, I'm one of the uh, Fundamentals Webinar leads. I'm in the Education Department here in, at Blockchain at Berkeley, and I'm also an Accelerator Fellow. And I'll let, the, I'll let Alpin introduce himself. Hey guys, uh, I'm also part of the, or I'm part of the Consulting Department in Blockchain at Berkeley, and I'm also one of the student leads and uh, fundraising directors for our uh, accelerator, it's the Berkeley Blockchain Accelerator, um, our in-house non-dilutive startup accelerator. We'll awesome, there. awesome. Well, let's get right into it. Scalability. So what is the scalability problem? Well, in the past lectures, we've learned that Bitcoin offers us many different features and, and guarantees. At the most basic level, Bitcoin gives us this, uh, well, the Bitcoin. It's a transfer of money. It's a, it's a system to transfer money from one person to the other. Um, and like one layer above that, Bitcoin gives us many, many security guarantees, many privacy guarantees, and many functionality guarantees. Um, we know that when we use Bitcoin to send um, some money to another person, we can do this pseudonymously. We don't have to reveal all of this personal information just to send some money from one person to the other. Additionally, um, we know that this network can run on a system of nodes and we can do this in a decentralized manner where there's no institution or, or one company that is, that is um, ruling over everything and, and, and uh, monitoring the network like that, like in that way. And so the goal of scalability really is to provide all of these services that a blockchain offers to all users, independent of how many users there are. Now I say a blockchain and not the Bitcoin blockchain because the Bitcoin blockchain isn't the only one out there. And today we'll be kind of go into that. We'll be evaluating scalability solutions for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think that'll provide a really cool perspective on scalability. And so what we wanna do in, in, in the general case of a blockchain is a blockchain is nothing without what it provides. You know, we, don't, we wouldn't care about Bitcoin if it didn't provide security. We wouldn't care about Bitcoin if it didn't provide privacy and pseudonymity and all these things. So we wanna make sure as the blockchain grows, as more users join the network and as our entire Bitcoin community grows bigger and bigger and bigger, every person is able to reap the benefits of all of these features and all these services. But at the end of the day, that's not a hard, that's not an easy problem to solve. You know, so many different, there's so many different layers that go into a, uh, into a blockchain. And so when you tweak one thing, you can find you know, it's kind of like a butterfly effect where you, you know, you change one little feature or one little thing about the blockchain and it has drastic impacts and influences all across the network and it could affect something completely somewhere else. And so we see that in this scalability triangle where, um, you know, imagine we improve scalability in some way, this might be detrimental security. Or if we improve decentralization, this could be detrimental for scalability. And so, really our goal with um, scaling Bitcoin and any blockchain is to find a balance between the three of these, to find some solution that is able to give us scalability while also giving us security and decentralization. So an example of this would be, well, if we want the Bitcoin blockchain to be faster, if we want more transactions to be able to be handled per second, well, why don't we just, I don't know, decrease the difficulty of the hash puzzle? So what would this mean? This would mean miners don't have to take 10 minutes to solve a block or to put together a block and solve it and then propose it to the rest of the network. But what if you know that whole process took one minute to solve a block? Well, there we go. We already have a 10 times increase in the number of transactions that can be put onto the blockchain at any given moment. Blocks would, instead of every 10 minutes be put on the blockchain, it could be put every one minute, you know, 60 seconds 
versus 600 seconds. And so this is great, right? We've solved it. We've solved scalability. End of lecture. We can all go home. Well, not really. See, um, if we decrease the blocks, uh, the time that it takes to confirm a block by that much, this is horrible for security. And one example could be, you know, the 51% attack. The 51% attack relies on the assumption that for a node or for a miner or for a malicious actor to try to attack the network by um, working on their own blockchain that is longer and has more work than the honest real blockchain, it would cost way too much, you know, money, electricity, power, time to even try to do that, especially because for every block, it, it would take them in the usual case, 10 minutes, and they have to uh, maintain that lead over the honest blockchain for increased amounts of time. If we just made it one minute, then it would be, it would cost much less. And so we couldn't really rely on that assumption. And so 51% of tax would, at the end of the day, be made much easier. So this is such one example of, you know, something that's really good for scalability is really, really bad for security. And so our goal here is to find a good balance between the three of these. Uh, this here is a table of transactions per second of um, different uh, money transfer systems that we see today. So we have Bitcoin here being compared to PayPal and Visa. As you can see, Visa is up in the tens of thousands of transactions per second, while PayPal is in the hundreds of transactions per second, and Bitcoin is dead last at three, max 3.2 transactions per second. And so, um, yeah, debatably, this is an unfair comparison just because, uh, you know, Bitcoin and Visa, they're, while they might seem the same, they do different things under the hood. But TPS is something that people care about. So it could, in, rea in reality, um, many end users will just be worrying about the TPS. Uh, obviously, we care about the security and privacy and all that, but uh, it's still an important metric to think about and to keep in the back of your mind. And so before we go into the rest of this lecture, there's some terms that we should define. Um, you may have heard of layer one and layer two uh, when doing research in general about Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these other blockchains, but uh, let's just make sure we're all on the same page. So it's, it's very simple definitions. Layer one refers to the main blockchain architecture. So this is the base layer. This is the actual Bitcoin blockchain. This is the actual Ethereum blockchain. And then if we go down to layer two, skipping L1 solutions for now, a layer two is a secondary framework or protocol that's built on top of the existing blockchain. So it's not the actual blockchain, but it's uh, you know a side chain or a, or a framework that is that works in parallel to the blockchain, but isn't actually that blockchain. And so oftentimes we'll categorize different scaling solutions by whether by what they're actually changing and what's the, what they're updating or upgrading. L1 solutions change what's on chain. So these make fundamental changes to the way that uh, the blockchain works. For example, uh, a consensus mechanism change or a, the, a change in the way transactions are structured. L2 solutions are made completely off chain. So these could be, for example, the Lightning Network or Ethereum Plasma, which are both scaling solutions that we'll go into today. And so are there any questions so far? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, please join the uh, Facebook group for this webinar. We do weekly recap posts where we recap the questions that were asked in lecture with much more fleshed out answers. And um, uh, hopefully a, another lead could put that link into the channel or in, into the chat. And also please feel free to ask questions throughout the chat. We have our education team working behind the scenes to uh, answer questions. So please put them in the Q&A. Um, I actually can't see the Q&A, so Alpin, if there's anything pressing in there, let me know. But for now, I'll just move on to the, uh, the first solution. So um, we'll be going into layer one solutions, but in actuality, there isn't really a clear divide um, in, in these solutions, but we'll just kind of talk about uh, these in general. And then one more thing to note is that as I mentioned before, we'll be going into Bitcoin and Ethereum scaling solutions, um, and we'll be sure to clearly define which blockchain is for just so it's not confusing. So the first one, or this, before I get into the first one, I'm getting ahead of myself. What are some layer one scaling solutions that you guys have heard of? I'm curious to know 
please put in the chat, you know, anything you've heard of and let's get some audience interaction in here. Segway, beautiful. We'll be talking about that. Let's get like two more, anything, anything. All right, all right. Well, hopefully after this lecture, you'll have a couple more answers to this question. Oh, I just saw something right before I closed it. Proof of stake for everything. Yeah, yeah. Different consensus mechanisms can change the number of transactions per second. Um, so definitely. So the first one we're going into is not SegWit. It's actually Taproot. Uh, it's the same vein of thought. Taproot is a um, BIP, a Bitcoin Improvement Protocol. And what this means that it, this is an update to the actual Bitcoin uh, blockchain. And it's an update that is being worked on as we speak. It was proposed a while back, but Bitcoin moves very slowly just to make sure nothing breaks. And so Taproot is uh, one of these upgrades. And so what Taproot does is, well, first let's look at some problems that existed before Taproot. So the first problem is that signature verification is very, very slow. And so if we think back to previous lectures, what is signatures? Well, on the, uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain, the way that we claim that we own Bitcoin, the way that we're able to prove to others that we own some Bitcoin that was sent to us is by proving that we have the private key that corresponds to the public key that the Bitcoins were sent to. Now, one way to do this is to just literally show everyone your private key and then they can you know, make sure that the private key corresponds to the public key. And they're like, oh yeah, that is Seance Bitcoin. And then all's well that ends well, but not really because now they know your private key and then next day all your funds are stolen and that's just not a good idea. You don't wanna show anyone your private key as we talked about in lecture four about wallets. So how do we do this? Well, we use a digital signature and what these digital signatures allow is for um, me, this allows users to prove that they own, that they have the private key that corresponds to the public key without actually revealing their private key through some fancy schmancy uh, cryptographic hash functions or cryptography in general. And so as you can imagine, signature verification happens all over the network. Um, miners, for example, are always validating the signatures of transactions. You know, for example, when a new block comes in and a miner adds a new block to the end of a blockchain, every single full node and some other nodes, but every most of the nodes on the network have to take that block, look at all the transactions, look at all the input transactions that are going into those transactions, and then verify the signature for each of those transactions, which you know, sums up to many, many signature, signature uh, validations that are happening every 10 minutes or so, because that's when, you know, that's a frequency that uh, new blocks are added. So that's already a lot, of a lot of signatures that have to be validated. Additionally, when a node newly connects to the network, um, they don't have any idea of what the blockchain is. So they have to connect to some peers and then go through this process called initial block download or IBD. And uh, what they do during this is they ask their peers for all the, blo all the uh, blocks that have been on the blockchain since the Genesis block all the way up to the most recent block. And they have to receive those from their peers. And when they do this, every time they come in, they have to get the block and verify all the signatures of all the transactions inside of the block. And so, as you can imagine, the Bitcoin blockchain today is somewhere between, like, it's like 200, 300 gigabytes. And so that's a lot of signatures that have to be counted up. It's, somewhere around 1 billion, I think. Uh, also, when a, node, when a node has been like disconnected from the network for a while and then they connect back again, they have to get the blocks that they missed out on. So that's another time that a signature, uh, a lot of signatures have to be validated. And so what Taproot does is it provides, it's, it's kind of this, you know, it, it helps a lot of different um, assets, or a lot of different facets of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, namely, uh, scalability, functionality, and also privacy. But today we'll just be talking about the scalability part that it helped because you know, the other parts are very in depth, but Taproot is very cool. It's, you guys should definitely um, do, some own, do some research on your own time because the way that they did Taproot was just uh, ingenious. Um, and so one other problem before Taproot was that um, when you had a multi-signature transaction, and if you remember multi-signature transactions are transactions in which multiple participants could uh, spend the output or could verify that a transaction could be spent. So 
if you have like a two of three multi-signature, then two people could unlock a transaction and spend the output uh, without the third person knowing. So you have to have two out of the three people there. And so the problem was, um, you know, transactions obviously are available for any user to see on the Bitcoin blockchain. That's the point of this distributed ledger. Um, but the problem was that users could see whether a transaction was multi-signature or whether it was just a regular one-to-one um, -one transaction. And um, yeah, this led to, this could, you know, you generally just want to decrease the amount of information that any user knows about your transaction. So this was also a problem. Also, all the scripts could be could be seen by other users. And scripts, if you remember, are just uh, spending conditions. So these scripts are basically just uh, expressions that are evaluated to true or false. And if it's true, then you're allowed to spend the Bitcoin. If it's false, you're, you're not allowed to spend the Bitcoin. Very simple. And so, um, but these can be used for very, very, um, for various uh, uh, implementations. Um, and they're basically like smart contracts where you can, depending on some amount of information, allow someone to use some Bitcoin or not allow them to use Bitcoin. So yeah, and uh, the problem was that many users could just look at a transaction and see all the scripts inside. And if it was a multi-signature or not, which is very bad. And so if we look into what Taproot actually did, Taproot built upon two ideas that existed, you know, before, before Bitcoin and, and um, these ideas are Schnorr signatures and also Merkleized abstract syntax trees or masts. We won't be talking too much about masts today, but we'll mainly be focusing on Schnorr signatures because this is where the bulk of the scalability increases came from. So um, the idea here is on the previous slide, we saw that signature validation was, you know, it just happens all over the network. And it, a lot of the network's compute power is dedicated to validating these signatures. And so what if we made signature validation faster? Then that's a scalability solution. We're making the network faster because it can just verify signatures faster. So then a whole, a whole bunch of things can happen. Transactions can be put onto the blockchain faster, namely. So what Tapper did was it replaced ECDSA signatures with Schnorr signatures. If you remember, ECDSA, it used the elliptical curve to kind of generate some, some hash functions. This was back in lecture three. And um, it replaced, yeah, Tapper replaced these old signatures with Schnorr signatures. The reason being Schnorr signatures are literally better in every single way. It's, it's not even funny. Schnorr signatures are just superior. The reason that we couldn't, or the reason that Satoshi or you know early Bitcoin devs didn't include it earlier was because it was under patent, so we legally couldn't. But now it's it's all good, and and they're being implemented into the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's really cool. And so what did what does Schnorr signatures actually do for us? Well, there's a couple of different things, but today we'll just be focusing on key aggregation, and um, the fact that you can verify signatures in linear time. And so what this means is that, um, say you have a multi-signature transaction. Whereas before these multi-signature trans signature transactions to verify, you would have to, you know, say it was two of three and you had two people who were, um, you know, trying to use a transaction. Well, both of those signatures would have to be verified one by one. But now with Schnorr signatures, what you can do is you can combine um, those two uh, public keys into one aggregated public key. And then you combine the signatures that verify those public keys into one aggregated signature. And so now you have one aggregated public key that holds um, technically two public keys. And then you have an aggregated signature that holds technically two signatures. And you're able to just validate that one signature or that validate that one signature, therefore validating that one public key. And so, you know, this seems very basic, but once you get to like very, very large multi-signature wallets, um, the time for signature validation became very, very large. Um, and also this isn't only useful in multi-signature, but also everywhere else that we um, saw mass bulk signature validation. And so, like I said, multi-signatures became much, much, much faster. Um, I think, uh, yeah, Bitcoin Optech, which is uh, a company that helps Bitcoin companies um, kind, of, kind of grow and incorporate new changes to Bitcoin, uh, did like a research study and they found that this led to 30 to 75% savings on multi-sig, which is a lot. This, this makes multi-sig transactions much, much faster to validate. And another cool thing about Schnorr signatures is that it allows for batch validation. 
And so batch validation is some magical cryptography thing that I honestly do not know about. But basically the idea is it's a process in which many signatures can be verified uh, at once faster than verifying each signature individually. And so uh, also the, it was really cool is that this speed up grows logarithmically. So um, if you remember IBD or initial block download, I said that um, you had to verify like 1 billion transactions because that's just how many transactions or sorry, signatures, because that's just how many signatures there have been since the beginning of the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain. Well, this could be done four times faster, which is a huge increase in uh, speed and efficiency. Um, and then one other thing that Tapper did, which doesn't really have too much to do with scalability, but it's just a nice privacy benefit, is that um, it hides it hides the scripts that are tied to a transaction that weren't used to actually validate that transaction. So when you have a bunch of scripts that you potentially could use to use a transaction, um, you're generally only gonna be using one. So um, what happened before was that all the scripts would be revealed. And so a lot of private information could be revealed, but now with Taproot, only the one script, only the one spending condition that was actually evaluated would be revealed to the rest of the network. So huge privacy benefit um, and that's really cool. Um, and so what this allows, what Taproot allowed in terms of privacy and functionality, we're kind of moving away from scalability, but just talking about Taproot in general was that, you know, as far as privacy goes, many different transaction types, multi-sig transactions, transactions with a lot of scripts, et cetera, look the same as a regular transaction because of all the things I said before. Um, one, a, a multi-sig transaction would look the same and cost the same as a regular transaction. And so this basically made it impossible for like, you know, any malicious actors who are monitoring the network to figure out, you know, the network topography or what's going on. Basically everything just looks like a regular transaction. So, you know, they can't really, you know, uh, glean any information from that. Also, as I said before, all the scripts of a transaction are not broadcast for literally everyone to see. So these are uh, privacy benefits. And then also in terms of functionality, um, we can now do very, very large K of N multi-sig. So imagine N is a large number, like 10,000 or more realistic, like a thousand maybe. And K is like somewhere in the hundreds. Um, but while as, whereas before this would be very, very slow because you would have to validate each signature one at a time. Now we can just make one big signature and bam, we're all done. And we can also use much, much larger scripts. So any questions about Taproot? That was, that was Taproot in a nutshell. Taproot is a backwards compatible upgrade. It is a soft fork because Bitcoin core devs do not like hard forks because hard forks are very, very, very bad for the network. Um, do you mean that blocks, when you say the network is faster, do you mean that blocks get added faster than 10 minutes? No, <laughs> blocks do not get added faster than 10 minutes. That 10 minute uh, limitation is due to the hash puzzle. So the cryptographic hash puzzle that miners must solve is kind of the uh, bottleneck that you're talking about. And that does not change, or it does change depending on how fast you know previous blocks were mined, but it stays around that 10 minute mark. Why do we need to use multi-sig wallets again? Well, one example of using a multi-sig wallet is if you, if I own, you know, if I own a wallet and I'm just, you know, I have the key that uh, unlocks a wallet and I'm, I'm able to use all the Bitcoins in that wallet. Um, I could be very clumsy and I could just delete the key, forget the key if it's a brain key. Uh, I, I could lose it in some way and I, I probably will. So what I would want to do in this case is um, say I have a family member who I trust or maybe an even better example is just like Coinbase. Um, if I have a wallet with Coinbase, what you can do is make it a two or three signature or two or three multi-signature wallet. And so I have one key, Coinbase, or I have two keys. Coinbase has the other key. If I ever lose one of my keys, usually I would be screwed. I wouldn't be able to unlock the wallet, but Coinbase can step in and provide their key so that now my key and their key is two keys. And so two or three multi-signature wallet, we can now unlock the wallet and use, use the funds. 
And so it's uh, in that case, it's a fail safe, but also you can do some really crazy things with multi signature and um, build up some really cool smart contracts. Also, it's essential for um, like Lightning Network and stuff. Yeah, okay. I'm going to let the education members. Multi signature wallets, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know the percentage of like transactions that are multi sig, but they are pretty common. And so you can imagine like one multi sig wallet could, before Tapper, could be the, the equivalent. So the, the cost of one multi sig could be the equivalent of the cost of like 10 transactions. And so now we're just kind of compressing that into one. Um, there isn't a risk in that case for Coinbase to send transactions because it's a two of three. You need two signatures or you need two keys to unlock the wallet. Coinbase only has one, so they would never never be able to use it without our permission. And so let's go on to the next section, which is the segregated witness. This is uh, what Chris brought up, and I'm really glad he did. So I say L1 plus L2 up here because segregated witness is, it's not really contained inside one category. It's kind of just, yeah, this, this update was, huge for the blockchain for the bitcoin blockchain it it basically modified or updated and, and changed in some way like every part of of bitcoin and so it was very controversial uh, this this was activated back in january around 2017 i think and um it's now in full force or probably in full force i don't i don't really know because i don't know the, what the other nodes have done but um basically let's 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 talk about segwit so um some problems that existed before Segwit. Well, transaction malleability is a problem. So uh, ideally what you want on the Bitcoin network is you want each transaction to be mapped to one identity. And what that identity is, is a hash of the transaction. So you want each transaction to kind of be able to be identified by one hash. But what happened was um, what you could do was inside of a transaction, you could kind of tweak you know, a couple of characters here and there of, of non-essential properties. So really the essential properties of a transaction are the inputs, the outputs, and like the amount that's like inside of it. But um, yeah, there were some, there was some other information that we'll go into detail in the next slide that made it possible to change just a couple of characters and therefore by the avalanche effect of hashing functions, change the identity of the transaction completely. And so this could lead to some interesting like Nile of service attacks and some you know flood like weird attacks that, that you could do. Also, there was an uh, a really inefficient script versioning system. So I've mentioned scripts a couple of times. Um, scripts are um, basically like little mini, you know, it's basically like programming languages inside of Bitcoin. Um, but what happened before Segway was that it was very hard to change the functionality of scripts. It was very like convoluted and hacky. And so Segway kind of uh, fixed that. There are also um, very inefficient signature hashing operations. So again, we have the idea of signatures and also historic signature data was everywhere. Um, and the reason that this is a problem is because realistically, you only need to verify a signature, like only the miner really needs to verify the signature, right? So when the miner is putting together the, that next block, um, they're verifying the signature. And then yeah, all the other miners are doing it, but once it's on the blockchain, it's kind of like, and it's been confirmed. So you go through that, you know, six block confirmation time, it's on there forever. And so you don't really need to verify a transaction was valid because it's on the blockchain. You kind of assume that it's valid because of the work that miners have put in. And so we don't really need the signature data to be into the block afterwards. Um, it takes up a lot of space. And I think it's like 60% of a transactions, you know, decoded by code. So yeah, it's a, it took up a lot of space and uh, it was just everywhere unnecessarily. So first we'll talk about transaction malleability and what SegWit did. Um, if we look at the before picture here, this is a decoded transaction. And so what we have here is um, we had the V in, which you can think of as the input transactions. Remember the UTXO model, all, transact is all transactions are basically input transactions to output transactions. So we have the V in field, and then we have the transaction ID field identifying the transaction. And then if we look down, we have the script SIG and the script SIG is the signature of whoever um, used this transaction. So in this case, it's me, this is my Bitcoin. I provided my signature proving that 
this the public key that the previous transactions were sent to uh, sent Bitcoin to is my public key by because I have the private key. And so as you can see, the, the script sig is inside of the transaction when in reality, it doesn't really have to be. And so that's what SegWit, SegWit changed. If we look at the after picture, we see that, um, you know, this kind of array that the transaction is kind of housed in is, uh, you know, here and ends here. And then outside we have some witness field and you can think of witness as, you know, um, the, an, an, another name for the signature. So I'm kind of like, this is my witness. This is me testifying that this Bitcoin is mine in a sense. And so what SegWit did is now we have script sig field that is inside the transaction and now it's empty. There's nothing there. And my, my signature has been moved outside of the transaction. And you might imagine that this is a very small and minuscule change, but this has profound, uh, profound impacts on the rest of the network. So, um, and uh, just to speak about the transaction hashing anymore, before I could, you know, some, you know, malicious attacker could go in and change like a small character of my signature and it'd be totally fine because the transaction would still like be valid because it would still be the inputs and the outputs and, and the amount and all that stuff. But the transaction ID would be completely different because the transaction ID is a hash of the entire transaction. You change even one character, one bit, it's, 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 it's uh, completely different. And so now if I change some part of my witness data, some part of my signature, it doesn't affect the transaction. It's no longer in size of the transaction. Now transactions are mapped to one transaction. So each transaction you know will have this transaction ID. And so that's really cool. And it's very useful for um, things like the Lightning Network, which we'll go into later. And so uh, I guess like where did this signature data go and how, you know, how do we, maybe if someone really wanted to, they could, you know, go back to previous blocks and make sure that signatures are there. Well, um, what we do is we use our favorite data structure or not our favorite data structure, but a, one of the, one of our favorite data structures, the Merkle tree, and uh, we make a Merkle tree. But in, before we know Merkle trees have transactions as their leaves and we hash all the way up. And, um, but now, we have Merkle trees of signatures, but what's cool is we can mirror the structure of the transaction Merkle tree so that it's like kind of one-to-one. -one. And so like this, tr this transaction would have its signature right here. It's a very small picture, but um, you get the gist. And so this Merkle tree will be placed inside of the uh, Coinbase transaction, which if you remember is the initial transaction that a miner puts into a block to pay himself some, the, the reward for solving the block. And so now we have the signature inside of the blockchain and then anyone can look at it and, and make sure that it's there. Um, so just to tackle the other problems that SegWit solved, um, scripts, we, we go back to this idea of scripts, AKA spending conditions, AKA smart contracts, but don't get confused with Ethereum smart contracts. These are just contracts that are smarter than the average contract because it's on Bitcoin. Uh, and basically these are just a series of opcodes. Um, and so these opcodes, like, you know, do evaluate to expressions. And what you would do is you would just kind of put them in a line and Bitcoin script would compile and read them from left to right. But to implement changes to the script, you had to find an extra opcode that wasn't really being used and then like replace it. And as you can imagine, this isn't the best way of, uh, updating scripts, especially because scripts, you know, you, you want to, you want to keep up with the demands of the users and uh, you want to keep adding new functionality. So what SegWit did was it introduced version numbers so that upgrading to different script versions was literally just changing a number. Um, and if you remember Taproot changed, um, <clears throat> Taproot added Schnorr and Mast and um, this, this update kind of made upgrades to Schnorr and Mast and overall Taproot much easier. Um, also signature hashing, um, before there was this problem of, you know, uh, when you were hashing signatures, you know, if you doubled the, the size of a signature, it could take like four times as long to, to hash, but now, uh, SegWit did some magic and, um, now each byte only has to be hashed at most twice, which uh, kind of solved this problem. And that's also a scalability solution or a scalability benefit, I, would, I should say. Uh, and scripts, you know, a script version is, is a scalability benefit because 
it kind of uh, made it possible for future iterations to kind of keep up. And so, you know, as you're growing the network, you can add more functionality to your scripts much easier. And so if we evaluate SegWit, you know, from as unbiased of a perspective as we can, well, a pro is that if it, it fixed transaction malleability. Um, and this is huge because the Lightning Network would be much, much, much harder to implement if it weren't for transaction malleability and also side, other side chains. And also in general, um, it kind of prevented some attacks that used just changing the hash of a transaction and flooding the network with those transactions, which could very greatly um, uh, increase the latency throughout the network. Segwit was also a soft fork. It's uh, backwards compatible. It didn't completely disrupt the network. It was, um, uh, yeah, it, it didn't require any of that. And it was just kind of this update that was pushed and it was up to the nodes to kind of uh, upgrade to this new version. It increased efficiency through, you know, the uh, benefits we had through scripts and also signature hashing. It increased the block size. Now this is interesting because as I mentioned, um, it took the witness data outside of a transaction. And so what Minus could do is, you know, replace that witness data with more transactions. So by, it didn't actually increase block size, but by removing what was inside the block, it increased the block size. So you could put more transactions out of a block. So that's really great. And also uh, theoretically led to a smaller size of the blockchain. Now, if we look at the cons over here, we have um, one time linear capacity increase. Now uh, you can think of it as a con, but you know, all SegWit really did was kind of increase the block size by a little bit. So that's a little bit of a pro, um, you know, not, not that great. It's, it's, it's pretty cool, I guess. It also obligated wallets to upgrade. So it was the nodes that had to upgrade voluntarily to this new, this new version, which uh, you can see as a con because um, yeah, you had to rely on the, on, the, on the nodes, which that's kind of where the controversy was. But if you're interested in that, uh, research that on your own, look up ASIC boost. That's kind of, that's basically the reason why. Um, and also uh, better ways to solve malleability exist. And so this method of removing the witness data, that's not the best way, like it's not the most engineered, you know, op, like a optimal method, but you have to realize that the Bitcoin core developers had to keep into account the needs of the miners, the users and the developers and kind of reach consensus between the three of those uh, different types of, of uh, I guess, entities of uh, re regarding the Bitcoin blockchain. So this is like the best compromise that could be met um, in terms of finding a solution that, for lack of a better term, solve these problems. And so next, oh, first off, any questions about SegWit? Into the chat. I'm glad I answered Chris's question. All right, um, looks like we're chilling for now. So I think next Alpin's gonna hop in and talk about sharding. So we've been talking about layer one scaling solutions in the context of Bitcoin. Uh, now we're moving uh, into a more general context and some of, uh, I guess this sharding in particular might sound uh, relevant from uh, ETH 2.0 and um, many of the other non-Bitcoin blockchains that have been trying to implement scaling solutions. And uh, the idea behind sharding is that uh, one of the most characteristic features of a public blockchain is the fact that the entire history uh, of transactions has to be stored by every full node, uh, which is yeah one of the greatest features, but it's also one of the biggest hurdles that we face when we try to scale a blockchain. And uh, sharding very directly addresses this hurdle uh, by uh, basically saying, instead of, uh, instead of having every node store every transaction and all data, uh, let's split up nodes into different categories where some nodes still do that, but other nodes can operate at higher throughput uh, with lower systems requirements 
uh, and still contribute to consensus uh, by basically taking ownership of a small portion of the blockchain. So what you're seeing right now is uh, a very, uh, an oversimplified uh, version of uh, sharding as a method of database partitioning. So this is not technology that is uh, new per se. Uh, sharding has been around in uh, database scaling uh, for a while, but there are some, uh, some nuances, uh, some subtleties that we have to pay attention to when we're carrying this over to scaling uh, a, a blockchain. So uh, at, a, at a very high level, a uh, sharded network uh, splits up the, this data and this, these transactions among groups of nodes. So in the context of blockchain, this means that uh, not every miner has to work on every block. And this has, uh, this has many implications. Uh, and uh, basically what ends up happening is you have a series of separate, but in some way connected blockchains uh, that uh, that each have much higher throughput than what uh, what a connected main chain would have without sharding. So uh, basically, it takes this sharding takes this idea of uh, this very binary idea in current so Bitcoin and Ethereum that you either have to store all data or store no data, and it takes this idea where there are these types of nodes, and it turns it into a sliding scale uh, where now you have a variety of nodes. And uh, next, so, yeah, so basically it just uh, makes it so you can, uh, you have different types of nodes that have different responsibilities, but can all contribute to consensus uh, without having to fall into one of those two categories. And this is really powerful because this means that now you can take a fundamentally limited system in terms of scale when every full node has to have downloaded locally the entire history of the blockchain. You have this issue of you know, being a little dramatic here, but you can only scale the blockchain as much as what one single machine can handle. You know, it, it's not exactly that, but fundamentally that's the idea without sharding. When you introduce sharding, now you open up this ability to become a node to a much wider group of, uh, I guess, machines in this case, if we're talking about a proof of work system, but, uh, but nodes in general. Uh, you have different types of nodes. A super full node has access to everything. It's basically a, uh, what would be the equivalent of a full node in a non-sharded network. Uh, top level node and single shard nodes uh, operate within their own uh, uh, sets of data and within their own shards and uh, ultimately are all linked together into this into this main chain. And light nodes carry over pretty seamlessly from, from a non-sharded network. It's basically just a client that can query other types of nodes. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, this type of database partitioning uh, introduces a whole host of new attack angles. And that is actually one of the reasons why sharding is still in development. Even, uh, even in an ecosystem as robust as Ethereum that has so much community movement, uh, it is taking years to actually develop and put this into place because you have to account for all of these different angles. And we won't go into too much depth about what these are and how to address them. But one very interesting example is uh, if, a, uh, if an attacker takes over one shard, so one shard uh, can mean a group of nodes that, uh, that are responsible for a specific set of data or transactions in the history of the blockchain, uh, and they, that attacker withholds all of that data from the rest of, uh, rest of the blockchain, rest of anyone who's querying that data, then, then they can actually meaningfully disrupt the network. If that data is required in a specific proof and uh, someone who's trying to run that proof cannot access it, uh, then you can basically uh, do what I think uh, Vitalik uh, Buterin called a 1% attack, uh, which isn't, uh, you know, you can't take down the network, but you can, uh, again, meaningfully disrupt the network. And these are issues that are uh, very real with sharding. And uh, 
it, they're one of the reasons why movement uh, towards sharding in a normal database is actually the last thing you want to do. Uh, we've reached that last resort uh, in, in blockchain because scaling is such a limiting factor. So it's being considered, but the, uh, but the upside in terms of scalability is tremendous. Uh, we're, we're talking many orders of magnitude of an increase in, in TPS. Uh, so if this can be pulled off in, for example, ETH 2.0, which we'll touch on later a little bit, then, uh, then the uh, effects would be uh, incredible. This, uh, this is a uh, pretty complex topic. Technically, I, I give a very uh, high level overview and uh, the type of sharding does uh, depend on, uh, on what assumptions you're making about the network. Uh, if, uh, if you're interested, we'll uh, try to link some resources uh, later uh, in the resources page uh, for uh, specific implementations of sharding, for example, how ETH 2.0 uh, is implementing it, but that's a general overview. Cool. It seems like we're okay on questions. Uh, we are getting a little bit low on time, lower than uh, than usual. So I think I'll move on from questions for now. Um, and now we get into layer two. Uh, we should, you all should be really excited because layer two is really where like, you know, the, the, the crazy ingenious well, layer one is, is really cool, but layer two uh, has, has a lot of potential, I think. And so again, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, what layer two scaling solutions have you all heard of? Please put in the chat, even if you don't think it's a scaling solution or just anything you've heard about layer two, let's see what you got. Lightning network, Chris's you know, on, the dot. <laughs> on point again, Blockstream, uh, Blockstream is a company, right, Alpin? They do some uh, research. Not familiar. not, not familiar. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Anything else? All right. I mean, we're not going to get much better than Lightning Network because that's literally what we're going to talk about, what we'll talk about next. And so uh, just to preface this, Lightning Network is like mind blowing. Um, it's super exciting and it has the potential to change Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin's future uh, for the better. And so, yeah, with, I mean, with that hypo, let's get right into it. Well, um, recall that with the Bitcoin blockchain, as we, as we know it today, every transaction is put onto the blockchain. And now like you might be looking at me weird because this is week eight of the fundamentals webinar. And this is something you learned back in like week two or three, but um, it's very important in the context of the Lightning Network. The reason that this is kind of a drawback is that, um, well, uh, if you want your transaction to go through and also be confirmed, it takes a long time. And so the classic example that everyone, that you've probably heard many, many times is like, say you wanna buy a cup of coffee with your Bitcoin, you know? By the time you, you know, pay your transaction, by the time you, by the, by the time you pay, the trans that, that transaction is validated and then confirmed, your coffee is going to, be, going to have cooled down because that's around an hour wait time. Why is this? Well, you generally want to wait. Best practice is you want to wait around six blocks to, to know that your transaction is actually on the blockchain and, you know, 10 minutes per block. It's about an hour. And so this is a long time. Transactions take a long time to, con to confirm. Also, each transaction has a transaction fee. Uh, if you remember, these fees are what incentivize miners to pick your transactions out of all the hundreds of thousands of millions of other transactions and put actually put it into a block. And so because uh, the idea of a fee, it's, it's basically a market, basically. Um, uh, the transaction fee itself is very inconsistent, dependent on the congestion of the network, dependent on a uh, number of nodes and some external forces like hype around Bitcoin and stuff like it's the price can go up and it can go way down. So it's very inconsistent. Also, transaction fees make it really not economical for low value items. So, you know, the idea here is that uh, if I want to send, you know, $5, like I, the idea is that I don't want to send small amounts of Bitcoin because the transaction fee could potentially double that or, you know, just 
add on to that small transaction a lot. So you, if you send large amounts of Bitcoin, it's much better because the transaction fee ends up being a smaller percentage of your total transaction. So, you know, that's what you want. Uh, another, you know, uh, a kind of along the same vein of idea, this makes micropayments impossible. Uh, micropayments, if you haven't heard of them, it's a very cool idea where it's very small payments. So you can think of it like a, as a stream of payments to, I don't know, some service or um, a popular idea that I think Brave, the Brave browser is doing is kind of micropayments to content creators on the internet. And so, you know, every minute you watch, every second you watch some content, you're giving them small amounts of tips and stuff and, and it, it helps them and it's not that detrimental to your financial uh, stability. So yeah, that's what micropayments are and they're really cool. And so, you know, the, the idea here is that putting every transaction on the blockchain, while obviously, you know, the way to go because that's how we know that a transaction is valid and it's went through, you know, has a lot of drawbacks. And so we get into um, this idea of, you know, what if we don't put every transaction on the blockchain? And this is a really weird idea because, well, as I said before, the transaction being on the blockchain is how we know the transaction is valid and it's went through. It's how I know that I sent Alpin one Bitcoin for whatever reason. You know, that's how I know that this is true. But, you know, let's just go, let's just run along with this idea. And so if we don't put every block, trans transaction on the blockchain, well, then we have two parties kind of trying to send a payment between each other or a, maybe a, a series of payments between each other without always needing to consult the blockchain. So can, is this possible? Can this be done? Uh, for this example, we're going to imagine that Alice and Bob are uh, honest, honest nodes or honest people, and they're not going to try to cheat each other, but uh, we'll, we'll have some slides talking about what happens in the case of if they aren't honest. But for now, they're honest and they're just trying to, you know, um, give some services and the other person try to pay for those services. And so here we introduce the idea of a payment channel. Now this isn't Lightning Network yet. This is just a general payment channel. Um, and uh, these exist separately, but the Lightning Network builds on top of these. So um, let's talk about payment channels. And so the idea here is that what if Alice and Bob maintain a private balance sheet? Um, and what this means is that what if Alice and Bob, instead of, you know, when Bob is, Say, say for this example, Bob is a really professional, really good guitar player, and Alice wants to take some guitar lessons. So Alice is receiving tutoring from Bob for each tutoring session because Bob is so good, each tutoring session costs one, costs one Bitcoin for, for some reason in this example. And so what if, you know, Alice and Bob, what if Alice, and Alice gets a couple of tutoring sessions and for each payment, she doesn't, immediately put on the blockchain, but instead they kind of keep between themselves this private balance sheet in which they note every tutoring session and that we're not every tutoring session, but where they basically just note how much Bitcoin has left Alice's account and how much Bitcoin has left, has entered Bob's account because the flow of money here is Alice is paying Bob for tutoring lessons. And the second bullet point says we only, Alice and Bob will only consult the blockchain when they want to settle the balance. So what does this mean? Well, to open up a payment channel, first we're gonna, you know, initialize this with a transaction that's put onto the blockchain. Um, this transaction um, kind of looks a little bit funny, but we won't go into that. We'll just say that this opens a payment channel between Alice and Bob. And so inside this quote unquote transaction, Alice has put in 10 Bitcoin, Bob has put in zero. And so now their payment channel is open and now they're not gonna consult the blockchain for future transactions until the very, very end. So, you know, one week passes, um, the first week passes and Bob has given Alice one tutoring lesson. So uh, Alice has paid Bob one Bitcoin. And so one Bitcoin has left Alice's account. One Bitcoin has entered Bob's account. So you can imagine in between these two balance sheets, we have Alice with nine and Bob with uh, one Bitcoin. And then, you know, a couple more weeks pass uh, to be exact, uh, six weeks pass. So each week is another tutoring se uh, session. And so now at the end of seven weeks, Alice has gotten received uh, seven tutoring sessions and Bob has received seven Bitcoin, one for each of those tutoring sessions. Now keep in mind, they haven't gone to the blockchain at all. They've just kept this secret between themselves. And since we are assuming that they're honest workers, this is fine. And so what they do is they take this net, uh, this, this net transaction 
they take the all the transactions that all the Bitcoin that has left Alice's account and all the Bitcoin that has entered Bob's account and put it into one transaction. So it's minus seven and plus seven, respectively. And then they take this net transaction and put this on the blockchain. And so the idea here is that to the blockchain, seven Bitcoin have, have left Alice's account and seven Bitcoin have entered Bob's account over the course of seven weeks. And if we look at, you know, at the real world, this is exactly what happened. Over the course of seven weeks, Alice paid Bob one Bitcoin every week. And so seven weeks, uh, seven Bitcoin. And so, but what we have here is originally, if they were to do this without payment channels, Alice and Bob would have had seven transactions on the blockchain. So seven times that they have to wait and confirm seven transaction fees. And we've cut this down to just two, the opening of the payment channel and the closing of the payment channel. And this is really huge because in between the opening and the closing, you it's not just seven transactions you can have. You can have theoretically any amount of transaction, an, an arbitrary amount of transactions um, in between. That's the magic of payment channels. Um, and so uh, we can look into the idea and, and the Lightning Network has this fully fleshed out in their white paper. So please look there if you're interested in this, but, and we'll just touch upon this, you know, very briefly, but you know, what if Alice or Bob try to cheat each other, cheat each other, you know? Um, what if Alice tries to receive a tutoring session and not pay Bob? Or what if Bob tries to somehow take all of Alice's big 10 Bitcoin instead of just the seven he's, he's uh, rightfully owed? Um, the Lightning Network, which is the system around that builds on top of payment channels will, you know, it, it incorporates fallbacks and refund policies and all these um, guarantees to make sure that uh, Alice and Bob, that neither party can cheat the other party. So you don't need to worry too much about that, but um, definitely, definitely uh, research more into that. So, so the observation here with payment channels. Now, remember, we're just talking about payment channels, uh, opening a payment channel, closing a payment channel, in between any amount of transactions. If either Alice or Bob cheat, well, the other party who is being cheated can just override and take all the money in the deposit or just the money they're owed. It's, it depends on uh, the situation, but uh, there is a, uh, you know, a, a fail safe in a, in a way. If Alice and Bob always cooperate, then they don't have to touch the blockchain, except for when they're creating a payment channel and then settling the balance. So we're reducing an arbitrary number of transactions to just two transactions. So we have this idea of a payment channel now. And what the Lightning Network does is builds upon this idea of a payment channel and creates this network of payment channels. And so we have this graph here. Um, let's say all the nodes in this graph with letters in them, all the circles with letters in them are users. So we, we've got Alice, we've got Bob, we've got Ethan, we've got uh, Dylan, we've got Frank, we've got Charlie. And we'll say all the edges or all the lines in between the circles are payment channels that are open between Alice and Bob, Bob and Ethan, Frank and Ethan, Dylan and Ethan, you know, these are all the lines are payment channels. And this is what the Lightning Network does. It connects all the users with payment channels such that any user that is, you know, somehow connected to another user is as if they had a payment channel open. And so just to clarify on that a little bit more, um, say Alice owes Charlie some money. Say uh, Charlie's this world-renowned pianist and Alice wants piano, piano lessons. And so um, Alice wants to pay Charlie, but does this mean that Alice has to open up a separate payment channel for Charlie? And you can imagine that like in real life, if you know, one day when this is implemented, it would be really annoying if you had to like, if you wanted to pay for something, you know, if you were transacting with like a merchant or like a store or something, you owe, every time you had to pay, you had to open up a new payment channel. That'd be really annoying. So what the Lightning Network does is Alice because there is a path that exists between Alice and Charlie, she can send money to Charlie through the Lightning Network and through this series of payment channels. So this is really cool. Alice can send money to Bob, then Bob will send money to Ethan, and then Ethan will send money to Charlie. And at the end of the day, it is as if Alice sent money to, to Charlie. And um, that's really the genius of the Lightning Network. It's just this network of interconnected nodes that, uh, you can utilize any path of payment channels in between any two nodes and send money in that way. And not just money, this is Bitcoin, mind you. And so let's evaluate the Lightning Network. Let's, 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 let's evaluate the pros and the cons. Well, assuming that there's enough capital in the system, in the network, this effectively means people can make Bitcoin payments instantly. 
we're taking all these transactions off chain and we're putting them into the payment channels. You know, when a transaction is on chain, you have to broadcast a transaction and all the nodes have to broadcast to the other nodes. And then a miner has to pick up the transaction and then put it into a block and then solve the block and then put the block into the blockchain. We don't have to do that. We're basically, you know, this is an oversimplification, but we're basically just plus one Bitcoin and then minus one Bitcoin from a bunch of balance sheets. And as you can imagine, it's much, much faster, basically instant. We no longer need to wait for confirmation times. Now, if I buy a, a cup of coffee, it's nice and warm. I know my transactions out there. I know it's been paid for and I can just drink my coffee and not have to wait an hour awkwardly in Starbucks. We only use Bitcoin blockchains to settle disputes. If there are disputes, assuming that you know the two actors and the two participants are honest, we only use the Bitcoin blockchain to close out payment channels. So this is super efficient. You know, Obviously from a user's perspective, we're only paying for two transactions instead of, I don't know, seven, a hundred, a thousand, whatever. From the network's perspective, we, the network no longer has to propagate all of those transactions. Um, all those transactions that would have been put on the network are now just in the Lightning Network. So, and the network is, is um, handling a much lighter load of transactions. You know, less load, that's, that's so much better for, for nodes and for users. We only pay transaction fees on the uh, transactions that we use to open a payment channel and then close the payment channel. So that's two transaction fees. Um, and like I mentioned in the earlier slide, this solves the problem of microservices or micropayments because micropayments are instant and free. Perfect. Theoretically, this takes the three transactions per second that um, we had in the TPS comparison slide and takes this and it becomes over, you know, 10,000s of transactions per second. I don't know what the exact number is, but it's, it's pretty huge. And so, you know, that's why I'm so hyped about Lightning Network because it's it's this is how it's able to you know change the face of Bitcoin forever. There are cons. Lightning Network is not perfect, not by any means. Um, you Nodes know, need to keep a large amount of capital locked up in payment channels. This is you know a lot of money is in these payment channels and not on the actual blockchain. So you can, you can kind of think of it as like wasted money that's just locked up in a vault somewhere waiting to be used. But uh, it's just a necessity of the, the Lightning Network. Also. There's a risk of centralization. Um, you know, that's the big C word that we're all scared of. But um, basically the idea here is that the nodes that are rich are able to uh, afford to run payment channels for longer than nodes that aren't as rich. Um, and so what this means is that if we go back to this, you know, graph here that we had, that's not it. If we go back to this idea here, um, you know, it might not look like this very even, uh, you know, uh, evenly distributed graph where each node has um, payment channels with um, you know many different peers, but it might look more something like this down here, where there's one rich node and all of the other nodes are like kind of centered to that, and um, all the other nodes use that node to go make payments to other nodes. And um, the the risk here is that you know if all the transactions are going through one node, potentially that node could you know monitor the network, monitor the transactions that are coming into himself and and leaving him. And um, you know, eventually, I don't know, like map out the network topography and map out an attack that could happen that way. But uh, and, and you can go into a lot of uh, uh, you can go down a rabbit hole thinking about the attack vectors. But generally, centralization equals bad. And so, uh, Linear Network does have a tendency towards what is called hub and spoke topology, where we have a hub and we have spokes like a bicycle wheel. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for Lightning Network. Are there any questions? Oh, our chat is blowing up. Exactly, yeah. If your fee is a third of the of the price of coffee, or if your fee is a half of the price of coffee and a third of the entire transaction, there's no way. Especially if you have Visa that you can just, you know, as an alternative. Um, what did the miners hate this idea? Yeah, I mean, miners hated the idea of SegWit, um, but SegWit still happens, so they could hate it. But uh, but here's the thing, though, right? Because um, you you can look at it that way, but also like it's in the miners' general interest for more users to use Bitcoin. You know, at the end of the day, miners, you know, uh, miners have put stake especially the big miners have put stake into the Bitcoin network, it's in their interest for the Bitcoin network to exist for as long as possible. So yeah, 
there's less transaction fees, but also there's way, way more users. So um, there's multiple ways to look at it. Payment channels are effectively like, yeah, Steven, Steven's got the right idea here. Visuals of lightning, beautiful. Yeah, lightning is just so sick. Uh, mm -hmm, good point, thank you, Chris. All right, uh, we're running low on time. So Alpin, what you got for us? So when we move outside of Bitcoin and we introduce the idea of smart contracts, for example, for Ethereum, uh, we can uh, we can do a lot more. Uh, so Plasma is one example of uh, form of scalability that introduces this idea of what are basically nested blockchains uh, and uh, child chains of the main chain just submit information up uh, about their state uh, and it they effectively achieve something similar to what, what saying was saying about, about lightning, where uh, some of the, uh, the processing can be uh, taken basically off chain or off the main chain at least, uh, which, which uh, has tremendous uh, scalability benefits. Uh, and uh, Joseph Poon uh, has a very good analogy for this that I'm going to borrow from a little bit here, but a network built, um, with plasma has uh, is analogous to a court system is is what he says where the main chain is the supreme court and the idea is that the supreme court doesn't look at every contract that happens uh, you only go to court when there's a dispute uh, and uh, if you extend that analogy to blockchain uh, and i guess in this case plasma is a scaling solution by name that's being used for ethereum so we'll talk about it in the context of ethereum uh, you only go to the main chain when there is a dispute uh, or when there's a periodic state update. Uh, and uh, this allows us to gain a lot of scalability, uh, significant scalability, almost on the level of something like sharding uh, without giving up enforceability. You can still look back and say, okay, what this person did was, was uh, wrong and not honest and we should punish them for it. Uh, you can use that proof uh, to uh, to build an incentive structure that that relies on the same visceral incentives that that the main chain does. So financial incentives like penalizing someone for not acting honestly. So that's that's the general idea behind uh, plasma. Uh, yeah, let, let's let's move on. The uh, last uh, topic that we're going to cover in layer two are optimistic rollups, uh, which are a layer two scaling solution that um, in the words of uh, Vitalik uh, Buterin provide medium level scalability now. Uh, that's what he says. Uh, the fundamental idea is to have computation be done off chain and data stored on chain. And since data is cheaper than computation generally to store, uh, and um, since we're offloading all of that computation from the main chain, uh, we can get basically up to two orders of magnitude scalability uh, from a TPS perspective, which is what I guess we're framing all of this as uh, without making any significant sacrifices uh, on, on other sides. I mean, there, there is obviously that issue with validating that the, uh, that the computation done off chain is, uh, is, is, done, is done validly. Uh, and the main way that that is being implemented in optimistic rollups is through what are called fraud proofs, uh, retroactively looking at the computation that was done, verifying whether it was done correctly, uh, and then uh, and then rewarding or uh, or penalizing uh, accordingly. So the most valuable thing about optimistic rollups is that they are ready. Uh, they are at production level now and will only get better with time. And that's why uh, we chose to include uh, optimistic rollups uh, at the end of this lecture, as opposed to the myriad other layer two scaling solutions. Uh, Vitalik says that even if ETH 2.0's other, uh, other scaling solutions are delayed, just optimistic rollups on their own can carry Ethereum uh, through uh, to the scaling that they need. So, so that just goes to show that um, the levels of scalability that we're looking for, we don't have to go uh, way off track from our, uh, from our goals. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, revisit our scalability triangle here. Uh, usually we would 
uh, want to put all of the different scaling uh, solutions that we talked about on here and, and discuss the trade-offs that we're making. But let's just talk about optimistic rollups where uh, we would be moving from security towards scalability a little bit. And this diagram is a little misleading. Uh, let's it'd probably be healthier to think about it as a full triangle where you can move freely in between these three different points as opposed to you know along the edges. Uh, we would be making a significant move away from security towards scalability with optimistic rollups and then going back towards security a little bit by reintroducing fraud proofs uh, to uh, to verify that computation was uh, was done legitimately, uh, yeah. So those those last two uh, optimistic rollups and plasma are uh, are scaling solutions that are currently being implemented on Ethereum, uh, but um, the fundamental technology behind them uh, extend extend well beyond. It's just the best example of it. And uh, since, since we're running a little bit long time, are there any questions? Let me check the chat. Uh, are optimistic rollups implemented right now? I haven't actually checked Ethereum's roadmap, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, unless they're uh, significantly delayed, they are either implemented or, or uh, in the short-term roadmap for Ethereum. Okay. so. Let's move on to the to the last section. This is more of or of an addendum, uh, just because uh, ETH two point is is a very uh, hot topic right now. Uh, so we just wanted to give a very brief overview of of sort of where Ethereum is. Uh, basically, of these three or four phases, Ethereum is on at phase zero, so they're still transitioning to proof of stake. There's, uh, there are a lot of reasons that this is being done as a scalability measure before something like sharding actually proof of stake uh, uh, counters a lot of the attack angles that, um, that are introduced when you move to a sharded network. Uh, but the reason that we bring uh, Ethereum up in particular in this lecture is uh, it's a great use case to track uh, all of the different scalability solutions that we've discussed, uh, especially um, especially ones that are, I guess, outside of Bitcoin. So you can obviously track SegWit, Lightning in the context of Bitcoin, but but the other more general ones uh, are sort of missing this core uh, core blockchain to track those use cases. And uh, Ethereum is a great example of them because uh, because they are in production, they are uh, transitioning into these scalability measures. So by tracking uh, ETH2, you're basically uh, tracking the progression of these different scalability solutions that we've discussed. And uh, just, uh, I, I think this is common knowledge at this point, but uh, if there's anyone out there who, who needs some, some more myth busting, <laughs> uh, ETH2.0 is on a multiple year timeline. So we can't have all of these things implemented by the end of this year. But that being said, uh, the uh, progression of, uh, of Ethereum 2.0 is, uh, is um, in terms of scalability is uh, very quick. So things like Optum scroll ups and, uh, and data sharding in the near future will probably provide most of the scalability that's needed, but uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, great. Thanks, Alvin. So um, just to wrap up here, um, we hope you were able to give you just a taste of the different scalability, scalability solutions that exist for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, unfortunately, we, were, we weren't able to go too in depth into any one solution, which, uh, you know, I don't know about Alpin, but I would have loved to do. I'm sure Alpin would have loved to get into more Ethereum stuff as well. Kind of had to pull back there because just because of time constraints, but um, yeah, Taproot is much more than just scalability. Segwit is much more than just scalability. Lightning Network is pretty much just scalability, but, and on all these Ethereum solutions are also, uh, have many more uh, attributes. And if you look into how they're implemented, it'll, it'll literally blow your mind because uh, this is really um, cutting edge technology and cutting edge solutions that uh, are very intricately and uh, expertly engineered. So uh, we'll be including many links to resources that will help you understand these solutions at a deeper level and help you uh, go down the rabbit hole. And I greatly encourage you to do so. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming to this uh, this lecture eight of the Fundamentals webinar. The next lecture will be on DeFi 
And then the lecture after that will be the conclusion lecture where we talk about a blockchain powered feature. So there's only two weeks left guys. Um, so please join us for those lectures. And if there's any last questions, please ask them in the chat. We'll stay here for a couple more minutes. But other than that, thank you so much and have a good Thursday night. Thanks everyone. Yeah.